Bob, you've talked about fundamental constants, which by definition sounds like it means the most fundamental thing in, in the universe that, that is forever the same. You've talked about them being necessary in an environmental context. H how could that be? It sounds contradictory. Well, it sure does. <laughs> but experimentally, that's the way it is. So my favorite example is the good old electron. So as you know, electricity comes in these little bits, yeah. which you measure the amount. Well, it turns out that if you measure it fast in a big accelerator, the amount you measure is more. And it continues to get more. We call it scaling of charge. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until when you get to the unification scale, it gets to be the same size as the strong interactions that hold the nuclei together. Now, that means that the property of the electron we think is fundamental is in fact a long wavelength, long distance scale property of the vacuum itself. What does this imply about the, the, the universe? If, 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 if the, what we think are fundamental concepts, are, are constants are, 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 are more concepts than constants. It means probably will eventually have a revolution in thought. Right now, believe it or not, our experiments are so primitive hmm. that the confrontation really hasn't happened yet. It's only on the fringes of particle physics that people understand this. But as we get to understand more and more, it will become harder and harder to deny the fact that what we thought was fundamental was just yet another example of something emergent. And probably there's something more fundamental underneath it. I'm a physicist, after all. We're all reductionists. But as of this moment, we haven't found them. Let's target that word you use, because it's a powerful one, emergence. A lot of definitions around. A lot of people use that. I want to know how you define it. I always define emergence the same way, because it's complicated. I mean a collective principle of organization that gives rise to a law it means a relationship among measured things that's always true. Mm. But the law vanishes away into nothingness when you examine little parts to see where it came from. Now, some would say the reverse, that you have fundamental laws, and then when they combine together, you have a higher level laws, which are less fundamental than the lower dimensional laws. This amuses me to no end, because then I ask the person, well, how do you tell the difference? Oh. They're both exact. <laughs> There's, you have red exact and blue exact. Well, of course, the difference between them is ideological. It's a belief system. Scientifically, there's no difference at all. Because you're defining it in terms of the measurement, in terms yes. of the exactness of the measurement. Yes and the precision by which you have it and the reproducibility of it, and whether that precision is at a higher level, so-called, or a lower level, you, you don't care if, I've got, if I get this right. You, you, you have, and there's a, there's a very concrete reason I do this. When you study science, the real thing, for long enough, you realize that that's the only rock you have to stand on. The only way that scientists have an advantage over everybody else is that they deal with experiments. Mm. Ideas, if they're wrong, aren't supported by the experiments, so you throw them out. Your moral authority comes from measurements, not only just measurements of qualitative things, precise quantitative relationships between things. That's what physics is. You've done significant work. You've no, your Nobel Prize is for the fractional quantum Hall effect. Now. Uh, Tell us simply what that means and why it's significant in, to understand this concept of emergence. Well, the effect itself is pretty simple. You just take a special kind of transistor, put it in an extremely large magnetic field, and cool it, make it very cold, and then measure its electrical properties. And they exhibit certain exact things. This effect was discovered in Germany by my colleague Klaus von Klitzing. It was a great shock. 
The fact question, of its exactness. Yes. The uh, idea that you might have had something like that had floated in Japan before, but no one imagined that it would be eight significant figures accurate. That meant there was a principle of organization there that no one had known before. Now, the fractional effect is a follow-on to Clissing's original discovery, which indicated something additional, namely that the electrons were going into a new phase. They were organizing themselves into a new, new phase, like liquid vapor gas, um, uh, except that it didn't have any precedent. And the most interesting thing about it of all was that it has what we call excitations, uh, charged objects that move around that are collective motions. They act like particles, but their electric charge is wrong. Hmm. It's one-third hmm. of the electron charge. And what's more, this one-third is exact. Well, what's fascinating is that, that when you have this collective that's becoming exact, the exactness of, of, of the large group is, is more exact than the component parts. Yes, and uh, there are many examples of that in nature. My favorite example is rigidity, but there's also superconductivity, the ability of certain metals to conduct electricity perfectly, superfluidity, the ability of certain fluids to flow without loss. Well, and these, though, then become, I think in your view, windows on how the universe itself works, not isolated exceptions to the way the universe works. Because that's a way to look at it. These are unusual, interesting, fascinating, give you a Nobel Prize for it, sure, but they're kind of exceptions on the, the, the great structure of the universe. You say no. No. Uh, of course, I can understand why people think that, but real experimental science doesn't work that way. Nature is, 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 is very pecunious. It doesn't let you know how things work easily. Every now and then it throws you a little dog bone, a little clue. And those clues, when you see them, are miracles. Now, you can say, oh, this miracle is an accident and throw it away. Or you can say this miracle means something and think hard about what it might mean. In fact, superconductivity is the prototype for a part of the theory of the vacuum of space that we now accept as probably right called the Higgs model. Uh, as far as we know, the universe is pervaded by something very much like uh, a superconductor. Mm. New experiments, of course, are trying to find out for sure. But that's a beautiful example of taking the tabletop effect and, and, and uh, ramifying it to bigger, bigger things. Which would mean that things that exist on, on, a, on a composite level are as fundamental, maybe more fundamental than its component parts, which is a radically different way of thinking. Well, you say it's radically different, but I don't think so. I think if you step back from the discipline of physics, you'll see that every one of us is an arch conservative. Where we're coming from is measurement. And we're very entertaining when we're talking about things we can imagine, but we're not entertaining when we're talking about measurement. Mm. There's no, there's no postmodernist belief stuff that happens there. Right? That's true. So when you have laws, a law is a law. That's the thing that's the miracle of nature. Who said that there should be relationships among measured things that are always true? It isn't at all self-evident. It's a miracle. And I, you know, I'd see, well, if you have one miracle, why would you expect two? That there, there should be two kinds of these miraculous things, one that's collective and one that just is. Uh, I think more likely the rest answer is that there's only one kind. Let me see if I got this right. Let's start with what we know for sure, the results of an experiment, exact measurement. Then we can go in one of two directions. We can go to more fundamental particles, smaller and smaller, or we can take that 
and go towards organization, towards an emergent property. And it's not, not necessarily self-evident which way you go. Is that right? That's right, except I'd like to put it a little more succinctly. What you're really asking is, where did the law come from? Yeah, exactly. Okay? And one idea is it came about collectively because of principle of organization. And the other idea is that it just is. Okay? The second idea is, in fact, a very profound religious idea that goes back way to the roots of our civilization. Now, you think about it a minute. It doesn't make sense that there would be two kinds of exact thing because they're too miraculous. So probably one of them is a myth. Now, I don't know the answer to this question, but I'm suspicious that the fundamental idea, the idea of fundamental law, this, the sense of experimental science may turn out to be completely mythological.